Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar of the SIGTEC Academy. I'm very thrilled about our guest today, Peter Kuhn from MME. And before we start, just a couple of words about myself and SIGTEC. So I'm a SIGTEC board member in charge of the education program at SIGTEC. I'm also a founder and managing director of Embarclo, a law firm for startups. And a couple of words about SIGTIC. Our mission at SIGTIC is to match smart money investors with the best early stage tech startups. And we provide a platform for investors to source deals, to network, to meet founders. And we also provide a platform for the startups to pitch at our events. So if you haven't you know, checked out our events, our upcoming events, please go to our website, sigtech.ch slash events. And we would be thrilled to welcome you on one of our events. And we have started the Sigtic Academy a year ago. We have our webinars, which you attend right now. We also have a skills course where investors share their skills, their experience with you. Please check out our videos on sigtech.ch slash academy or our YouTube channel, um, which you find when you basically search for Swiss ICT Investor Club. And please stay also tuned for our investor handbook, which will be a game changer. You can pre-order it on our website. We will basically also you know at the url for to pre-order the investor handbook in our chat so please um pre-order it which is going to be really amazing so um let's get started our speaker today is peter kuhn from mme he has been a partner for six years there at mme he has been a lawyer for 14 years He's heading the firm's startup desk. He advised on numerous financing rounds, both on investor and startup side. So I'm super excited to have such an expert with us today. And his topic is going to be how liquidation preference, valuation and anti-dilution interplay. So I'm very thrilled to hear what we investors should pay attention to when it comes to negotiating these terms so without further ado let's welcome peter to the stage yes uh, thank you very much uh, michelle for this very kind introduction so uh, uh nothing to add from my side i would say we uh, just dive in and let's get started so today um, I would like to talk about uh, the correlation between pre-money valuation, uh, liquidation preference, um, and anti-dilution protection. Um, what I see quite often uh, in uh, negotiations between um, founders and investors that um, pre-money valuation is there. There are quite lengthy negotiations about the pre-money valuation, but um, there is much less focus on uh, the liquidation, on the structuring of the liquidation preference uh, and the anti-dilution uh, provisions. So, of course, uh, the pre-money valuation is, is a very relevant factor, um, uh, but when we look uh, at the final allocation of the exit proceeds, um, such final allocation um, is, is the result of a combination of the pre-money valuation, but also uh, of the liquidation preference and the anti-dilution provisions. Um, so uh, I think investors and, and, and founders should be uh, aware of those correlations and uh, should not just look at those uh, provisions or those topics uh, isolated, but, I, but understand how they uh, are connected. Okay, so just to recap, the, so that means that basically an investor's multiple like depends not only on the pre-money valuation, but also basically how he negotiates the liquidation preference and anti-dilution provision. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, the, the pre-money valuation 
of course, has a very obvious and immediate effect. The higher the pre-money valuation, the less uh, uh, and the less shares an investor receives for a certain investment amount. But uh, yeah, as as you just pointed out, it's just uh, one one puzzle, uh, one piece of the puzzle. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, final uh, distribution of the exit proceeds, um, liquidation preference and also anti-dilution provisions uh, can become very relevant. And uh, I think uh, the parties involved should be aware of that from the very beginning uh, to prevent uh, bad surprises uh, at at the exit. Okay, so don't get too stuck basically on pre money valuation. Also consider other economic negotiation points. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, so let's have a look uh, at the uh, three terms that we just uh, were discussing about. So the pre money valuation or the three topics. So pre money valuation, uh, as I just said, just said, obviously determines the share the investor uh, acquires in a company for a certain investment amount. And uh, it is, of course, relevant to how many shares um, an investor receives. Um, so it can be decisive with regard to controlling rights. Um, as we all know, uh, board seats often depend on a minimal shareholding in the company. It is often agreed that uh, shareholders or a group of shareholders exceeding a certain uh, threshold, 10, 15, 20 percent, uh, depending a bit on the, on the cap table, uh, will be entitled to appoint a, a board member or a board observer. And also, of course, um, um, when it comes to uh, shareholder decisions, it is important um, how many shares or how what, what stake an investor has in the company. Uh, and also, when it comes to the to the, to the uh, distribution of the exit proceeds, it is relevant, but but it's but it's not the only relevant factor, as we will see uh, later uh, in this talk. All right. So then, just as a short refresher here, liquidation preference. Um, in general, we can distinguish between the non-participating liquidation preference and the participating liquidation preference. So in case the parties agree uh, on a non-participating liquidation preference, the investor will receive uh, the higher amount of the preference amount versus uh, his or her parata share at the exit price. So the preference amount can be the investment amount. So just one time investment amount um, equals the preference amount or it could also be the, the investment out amount uh, with a certain interest or a multiple of the, of the um, investment amount. But the non-participating liquidation entitles the investor in any case to the higher of the preference amount versus um, what you would get if the uh, exit proceeds would just be allocated between the shareholders according to uh, their percentage uh, of shares in the company. So quite different from that is the participating liquidation preference. Uh, what happens there is that we also have a preference amount, which can be uh, or is defined similarly as in case of non-participating liquidation preference. But in case of a participating liquid pref, the investor first received the preference amount, and plus, so, so we have uh, ex exit proceeds. Then the preference amount goes to the um, investor. Uh, and from the remaining proceeds, uh, they will be distributed uh, in accordance with the shareholding um, in the company. So participating liquidation preference, preference amount goes away first and then distribution according to the shareholding and uh, not participating. It is either preference amount or per the share, whatever is higher. Right. So, so just to like to recap, like the first non-participating is bas basically you agree with the startup, how much of your investment you get back one time or 1.5 times, maybe, you know, coupled with an interest. And the second, the participating is basically a double dip. So you agree how much, how many times you get your investment back. And then you also basically participate in the remaining proceeds, whatever is left after the liquidation preference has been paid, right? Exactly, exactly. So what exactly, Peter, you know, what is your experience? How do founders and investors, you know, pay attention to that, or how 
how is how are the negotiations when it comes to the liquidation preference? In my experience, not too much. I mean, I mean, I see it in in seed and and early stage fundings quite often a non participating liquidation preference, quite straightforward, uh, one time preference amount. So so if everyone is fine with that, uh, there's not too much to negotiate about that. But but. Uh, yeah, as I said before, it could also. I mean, it 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 will have a, a kind of a massive impact, and this we will see later um, today. Uh, the choice whether we go with the non-participating lake pref or a participating lake pref can have a massive impact. And um, when we look at um, the, the importance of that choice, I think uh, parties uh, tend to um, yeah give them quite less attendance compared to. For example, the pre-money valuation. All right. So, Peter, we have a question from Danny. So, his question is: Does liquidation preference also apply in case of normal exit, such as a trade sale, or only in the case of bankruptcy liquidation? Yeah. The, usually, it is structured that it that is uh, that it is it does apply in, ca in case of a trade sale. That's that's uh, the um, the scenario we're all hoping. <laughs> that we will uh, reach in case of an investment. So yeah, absolutely, it, it, it will also apply in such scenario. Awesome. Yeah, so, and then we can have a look at the anti-dilution protection. Um, so the anti-dilution protection becomes relevant in case of a down round. So what is the down round? The down round is when the issue price of a fundraising round is lower than the issue price of the previous round. So the investor of the first round gets financially diluted because um, the investor of the first round paid a higher price than the investors of the subsequent uh, financing round. And the concept or the idea of an anti-dilution clause is to protect the previous investors from a from a down route. Um, so there are different um, ways or, or how to structure that. So there's full ratchet versus average weight versus average weighted and within the average weighted um, um, anti-dilution protection, we can distinguish between narrow based and pro based. But in principle, um, the idea is that in case we have a down route, the um, investor of the first round shall be entitled to subscribe or receive additional shares taking into account the lower price of the of the pre of the subsequent round so he will be put in a position as if he would have had a chance to subscribe at least part of the shares to this lower uh, price of the uh, subsequent round so to which price exactly depends then whether it is a full ratchet or average weighted um uh, anti-dilution protection, uh, which we will also have a look uh, mm -hmm. later uh, a bit in more detail, but this is the, the, the concept is is to prevent or, or to soften the effect uh, of a um, down round for the investors who uh, at that time already have paid a higher price uh, for their shares mm -hmm. in the company. Mm -hmm. So so basically the, the anti-dilution is like a protection, you know, if you paid too much for your shares and in the next round the company is basically issuing shares for a lower price then you will get basically as an investor more shares because you basically you know paid too much for your shares and the other one the preference the liquidation preference basically how to get basically a better multiple on your investment right so one Absolutely. is like one is like um upside leverage and the other one is like downside protection exactly and here we see already the impact on the i mean in case you have a, we have a very high pre-money valuation in the first round it is more likely that we have a down round and the down round um has an impact on the higher valuation of the first round so so in as a result um in the end we are in a position where we would have a lower pre-money valuation from the very beginning, uh, so it it there is a there is a correction measure 
uh, in case we have a too high or it turns out that the uh, first round or the, the, the previous round um, pre-money valuation was turned out to be too high. And yeah, that's that's exactly what I was referring to at the, at the very beginning, that uh, pre-money valuation is not the end of the story. It uh, In case we have a down round, uh, there will be uh, correction measures usually implemented. Okay, so basically, this is also like a means to put pressure on the on the on the startup, right? If they basically, you know, set a really high valuation, then you basically can put as an invest pressure on the startup that okay, guys, I'm okay with that, you know, pre money valuation, but um, you just need to basically, you know, um, basically reach the next milestone in order to confirm that same valuation, and and otherwise you basically need to issue more shares to me. Absolutely. I mean, in case uh, of a full ratchet, which we usually don't see, but but in case of a full ratchet, um, investor can be quite relaxed in case of a down round because he gets more or less uh, fully um, uh, indemnified for the price he paid for the too high price he paid in the first round. But yeah, we will we will see that afterwards as well. But this is exactly the mechanism. Yeah. Okay. So, Peter, how many? You know, is it is it very common to have these anti-dilution um, provisions in early stage rounds, in pre-seed seed rounds? What do you see? What is your experience there? Yeah, I see them. I see them quite uh, quite often. Yeah, I I I've very rarely see full ratchet. I usually usually see average weighted, and and here pro based is um, like the softest version, and this is the one I see um, quite often. But uh, no anti-dilution protection at all. I see quite. Uh, it, it, I don't see it often that, that there's no anti-dilution protection at all. So it's rare. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Yes. So yeah. Then uh, look at the first example. So here, um, I would like to show the correlation between the pre-money valuation and the liquidation preference. So let's have a look at, on the left side of the slide. Uh, we have a pre-money valuation of 10 million francs. Then we have an investment amount of 2 millions. So um, with post-money, obviously 12 millions. The um, investor receives uh, one-sixth, so 16.7% uh, of the company. And we have an exit price of 24 million francs. So let's assume that we have agreed on a one-time non-participating liquidation preference, which means the um, investor receives either uh, receives the higher of either the, um, uh, the preference amount, which is in a one-time non-participating liquidation preference, the investment amount. So he either receives 2 millions or he receives 16.7% from the exit price from 24 millions, which uh, equals 4 millions. So, and because 4 million is higher than 2 millions, uh, he receives in this example, uh, 4 millions. Now we look uh, on the right side of the slide. Um, we increase the pre-money valuation from 10 millions to 18 millions. So it looks at first sight as a big success of the founders. They, they um, renegotiated and managed to, um, increased the pre-money valuation by, oh, they almost doubled it by 80%. And the remaining parameters remain the same, except that we switch from a non-participating leak pref to a participating leak pref. So we have a much higher pre-money valuation. Investor says, okay, I'm okay with that, but I wanna see a participating leak pref instead of a non-participating leak pref. When we look uh, at the results, so we have a pre-money valuation on the right side, of 18 millions, investment amount remains uh, unchanged. It's still 2 millions. So the investor gets 10% because we have a post money valuation of uh, 20 millions and the investor uh, provided 2 millions. And we still have an exit price of 24 millions. And now when we do the math, look what, uh, how much uh, the investor will end up on the right side. So as we have seen before, the investor receives first the investment amount. So we have 24 million francs um, exit price. 
two millions go straight to the investor. So 22 millions remain and those 22 millions, the um, investor will participate again. So double dip. So he will get another 2.2 million. So 10% out of these 22 millions and he ends up with 4.2 millions. And what we see here that um, the effect of the switch from the non-participating lake pref to the participating lake pref overcompensates the substantial higher pre-money valuation that we have on the right side. So although we almost doubled the pre-money valuation, the switch from the lake pref to the non from the non-participating lake pref to the participating lake pref um, overcompensated such effect. And uh, yeah, this is something that. Um, investors and founders should be aware of when they when they're discussing pre-money valuation and um whether or not having participating or, or non-participating like preference thanks for that example I, I think you know it shows very well how you can improve your upside potential as an investor and also for the startup founders that you know insisting on a high pre-money valuation is not necessarily the best option uh, if you then you know agree on a participating liquidation preference absolutely so let's look at the next um example so here we have the same um at the same parameters in principle um so we have on the left side the pre-money valuation of 10 millions, right side 18 millions, but we have a much higher exit price. So here, instead of the 24 millions that we have seen before, we have a 100 millions uh, exit price here. So uh, looking at the left side, so we have again 10 millions pre-money, 2 millions investment amount, post-money 12. So the um, investor ends up with this 16.7% and so 16.7% out of 100 millions is 16.7 millions, which is obviously much higher than the than the preference amount. So on the left side, the um, the exit proceeds, um, which the investor receives is 16.7 million. Uh, on the right side, we have the much higher pre-money valuation, uh, which leads to less shares for the uh, investor. So he only gets 10% here. Um, and the exit price again here is 100 millions. And as we can see here, so he receives first the 2 millions, the preference amount. And then um, with regard to the remaining 98 millions, so after we deducted 2 million from this 100 millions, which goes straight to the investor, um, out of this 98 millions, the um, investor receives 10% which is 9.8 millions. So he ends up with 11.8 millions, which is um, substantially less than on the left side. So here we can see that if we have a very high exit price, um, the switch from non-participating to, to participating cannot overcompensate um, the higher pre-money valuation because here the higher pre-money valuation has, has the effect um, that obviously that, that uh, on the right side, um, the investor has just less shares than on the left side and due to the very high exit price um, the investor is better off with the with the left uh, with the non-participating late breath so I mean here again um I think what what is important is that that investors and founders do these calculations uh, at the very beginning so that they do understand in which scenario um, which scenario we benefit the most or, or what is the most likely scenario i mean yeah i mean in case of an of a hundred million exit there's uh it's a, it's a pretty good scenario in any in any case uh but still i mean as we can see here it's just that we have the absolutely same uh, basis here we just changed the exit price and the outcome is totally different uh, with regard to the effect uh, of a non-participating lake pref versus participating lake pref so it just um yeah, it shows that that we should do our model calculations to understand um, what the effect uh, will be. So basically, the higher the exit price, the more important you know your stakeholding becomes in the company, and the more important basically is to you know also set 
a reasonable um, pre-money valuation, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So then we have one more example here. Um, when we look at the correlation between the liquidation preference and the exit price. So again, uh, left side, we have a pre-money valuation of 10 millions. Uh, same here, investment amount 2 millions, post-money valuation 12, exit price, here we go with 18 millions. This is what we changed here. Plus, we compare on the left side the one-time non-participating lake pref. And on the right side, we have the we have a 1.5 non-participating lake pref. So we have in both scenarios, we have non-participating liquidation preferences. But um, on the left side, the minimum amount, the preference amount is one time the investment amount, which means two millions. And <coughs> on the left side, it is 1.5 the investment amount, which is three millions. Now, when we're looking um, at the outcome, so here, as we have uh, 18 millions um, exit price, um, on the left side, we have the one-time investment amount is two millions. Um, when we um, distribute the exit proceeds based on the stake of the shareholder in the company, so the 16.7%, uh, is 3 million, so 3 million is higher than 2 million. So he gets uh, 3 million investor here in the, in the left side scenario. Uh, on the right side, um, we have 1.5 non-participating league pref. So the investor gets in any case at least 1.5 time his investment amount, which is uh, 3 million. And on the other side, compared to the 3 million, which he would get if he if the, the exit price is just distributed based on the shareholding, it's 3 million as well. So here there is no effect from that switch, but as we can see here, it depends obviously on the exit price. So in case we have an exit price below 18 millions, then we will be better off or as in, from an investor perspective, the investor will be better off with a 1.5 non-participating leg pref. So this guarantees just a minimal um, return on its investment, which is higher than just one time. Um, so if we're below this 18 millions, uh, it has an effect, um, this change from one to 1 1.5. Um, but if we're above a certain threshold in this, in, in this uh, example here, it's 18 millions. So if we're above a certain threshold, then um, the non-participating leg pref or the change from one time to 1.5 of the non-participating leg pref does not have an effect. So here again, it all depends on 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 the well. It's not. It's 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 just it it is it is a combination of, of many factors. It, it is it is um, what's pre-money valuation. It is um, investment amount. It is exit price. It is um, how to structure the leg pref. Then within the lake pref, also that we will have a look later as well. So we have possibilities to, to structure lake prefs um, in many ways. So here, uh, yeah, we can multiples, we can uh, add interest. Um, there are some other ways. So it's just um, we do have room for negotiations. And, and for example, uh, yeah, if we cannot, if we do not find a solution on the pre-money valuation, we can we can talk about package packages uh, which then may be uh, easier to agree on because um, all the parts involved uh, are, are more aware or are or, or pretty much aware on, on, on what this means in the different scenarios. All right. So, uh, I mean, it, it also means that if I understood, you know, correctly that basically if the, if an investor thinks, you know, that the pre-money valuation is, you know, a little bit too high, it especially, you know, protect. He can also he can especially protect his upside, you know, potential with um, the multiples with you know a participating liquidation preference or a non-participating liquidation preference with a multiple. And but if basically, you know, 
um, if, if basically the startup goes through the roof, then the pre -money, a low pre-money valuation has a bigger impact. So it's like basically it is important for investors to negotiate there, especially because it can have like a big impact if the exit is below average or average. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. we have a question. I think it concerns your previous slide. Can you go? Can you go back one yeah. slide? And the question here is: Could you please? I mean, the question is um, from Alexandra. Could you please explain again why does the investor get less shares in this case? I think she meant less exit proceeds. Yeah, but also less shares, right? So I mean. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the reason for the less shares is that um, if we have a certain investment amount and so a higher pre-money valuation leads to less shares, right? Because when we look at the left side, we have a pre-money valuation of 10 millions and have an investment amount of 2 millions. So the post-money is 12. 10 plus 2 is 12. And then, mm -hmm. so the investor brought 2 out of the 12 millions. So he ends up with 2 divided by 12, 1 divided by 6, which is 16.7%. And when we have a higher pre-money valuation, uh, as it is shown on the, on the, on the right side, the pre-money valuation is 18 millions. Investment amount is 2 millions. So post-money 20, um, which means that the investor brought 2 out of 20 millions which is 10%. So the higher the pre-money valuation, the less shares you get for the same investment amount. Um, so this, this is, I think this is one of the reasons why uh, parties tend to focus pretty much on the, on the um, pre-money valuation because it has an immediate uh, effect. So I just see it one. Fr I go one franc up with the pre-money valuation. I have I have uh, less shares and, and 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 vice versa. So and and it it's it's it takes uh, more um, effort to to understand what is the exact um, effect of um, switching from non-participating to participating, um, having um, other some uh, multiples as preference amounts uh, and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and then maybe I can also answer that question on, on the right side. Why do we end up with the 11.8 millions instead of the 16.7 on the left side? So on the on the right side, um, we have the participating leak pref, which means um, when we have an exit price um, of 100 millions, then the investment amount, uh, the 2 millions first go to the uh, investor. So, and then we have remaining 98 millions and with regard to this 98 millions the investor participates uh, with 10 percent which is the 9.8 millions what we can see here and the 2 plus the 9.8 uh, results then in the 11.8 million swiss francs thanks for explaining that all right so um i think you know from from a practical approach if if we have like investors, you know, and they are on a deal and the pre-money valuation is pretty high, I mean, how hard, you know, should you push for a better liquidation preference than the 1x non-participating? Yeah, I mean, I think in early stage investments, it is quite common that we do have this one-time non-participating leg pref. Maybe we could... Um, talk about multiples, but you you rarely see more than 1.5. So to see more than that, it's it's uh, happens quite rarely. Um, so yeah, I, I think the the goal. Well, I know I know it's not that easy, but but uh, we should find a a more or less realistic uh, pre money valuation. Uh, that's but but of course, and then we do have the. I think uh, um, even quite. The, direct impact on the pre-money valuation, of course, then has the anti-dilution, which we will see afterwards. So, because when we have a down round, then we do have a correction measure. Then. And like, uh, also, you know, just, just something, you know, I want to mention as well that 
basically the first early stage investor also need to you know be aware of the next round investors which will you know probably have the same liquidation preference he has which might basically hurt him after that also so it's like a uh, yeah pre pretty pretty tricky situation if you want to you know, negotiate uh, uh, like uh, investor friendly liquidation preference at an early stage yeah absolutely and i mean it's it's uh to a certain extent or to yeah to quite the far extent we everyone is sitting in the same boat and want to make it a success and to to remain attractive for um further investment rounds um yeah we should um it should be more or less balanced and, and too many um rights to jump in that will also um make it more complicated to attract further uh investors which will hopefully provide uh, substantial money to the development of the company thanks so much all right what else what's next no more questions so we go to the next slide yeah let's go to the next slide we don't have at, at, at least for now we don't have any other questions but i'm okay. sure there's more to come um yes so then <laughs> let's have a look at the correlation between pre-money valuation and anti-dilution protection um so yeah as as already uh, mentioned is um the the, the anti-dilution protection kicks in in case of a down round so which means that the issue price per share of uh, round two is lower than the issue price per share of round one um so uh, we have those different ways to structure the anti-dilution protection. We have the full ratchet anti-dilution, which uh, basically uh, aims to put the investor one in a situation as he would have had a chance to subscribe for his shares at the lower issue price of the second round. Um, and when we look at the average weighted anti-dilution clause, it's the same principle, but um, the investor will not be allowed to um, to um, um, sign for additional shares to the price of the second round, but it's somewhere um, in between. Um, so it's it's. Uh, between the price of the first round and the second round, depending a bit on the formula, which is uh, which then shall apply. But with it's the same principle at the end, the the investor shall get additional shares um, because he kind of overpaid uh, in the round before. Um, and then the question arises, where does he get the shares from? Um, so the shares can either be created by a share capital increase or uh, the founders can transfer a uh, part of their shares to the investor one. Um, in 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 any case, um, in particular, full ratchet can have a very negative effect for founders um, because, on the one hand, um, I mean, a a, a down round, a, a, a decrease of the value of the company um, hits them anyway, so uh, the, it has a negative impact on them. As just as, as it has on all shareholders, but with this anti-dilution protection, um, it uh, the, the effect for the founders is even, even higher, as we can see also afterwards in a in a. Okay. In so a, it's a uh, matter of dilution, right? Uh, so they get like diluted, and probably like they won't feel incentivized if they get diluted too much. Is that the reason? Yeah, uh, yeah. Plus, I mean. It is also the question, I mean, there are various reasons why uh, a down round could occur. So, of course, it could be the, the reason that the pre-money valuation was of, the, of the previous round was just too optimistic, but um, it could also be the case um, that uh, that the market or there were, were uh, I mean, now we have COVID, so it was not so easy uh, to foresee that. Um, so there can also be external factors, which just no one um, did anticipate at the time of the uh, first round. And then the question is, why should those negative effects, which 
yeah, were not anticipated by all the um, involved parties. Why should uh, this all be borne by the founders? So, so it's 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 also um, yeah, it's also a question of. I mean, at the end, it's it's risk allocation. If um, expectations do um, uh, will not be met, uh, but there can be various reasons why um, expectations um, were too high. So yeah. All right. So what do you think? Should we do we want to proceed with the examples? Yes. Um, can, can you hear me well, Michel? I'm just hearing that uh, it's uh, all good. Can you? Yes. So I, I hear you well. I think you know it's important not to put your hands in front of your um, in front of your mouth. So it's but I I would say ninety nine percent of what you just said was loud and clear. Very good. Make it a hundred now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let's have a look um, at the anti dilution protection how that works so let's assume we have a financing round one with a pre-money valuation of 4.5 millions the investment amount of an investor one is 500,000 um, so we have 5 um, million post money valuation um, let's assume we have 100,000 shares so the price per share is uh, 5 millions divided by 100,000 so 50 francs and let's say we have two founders the both of them um, have 45,000 shares and the investor here with his uh, investment amount of 500,000 and the price per share of 50 francs ends up with 10,000 so we have um, with 10,000 shares so he, he has 10 percent and on the very right side we see the value so we have to post money five millions investors five ten ten thousand shares uh, have a value of five hundred thousand francs so all as it should be and then we have a round two and let's assume we do not uh, have a anti-dilution protection for investor one so we have a pre money valuation of 2.5 um, millions and we have still 100,000 shares here so um, the price per share is 25 francs which when we see that we have before the 50 francs now we have the 25 francs issue price um, which is lower so that's why we do have a down round here and let's assume we have another investor who invests now 500,000 and investor one who participated in round one does not participate in this second round. Um, so what happens is uh, if we do not have an anti-dilution protection, the uh, investor two receives for his 500,000 investment amount, he receives 20,000 shares. So he pays 25 francs per share. He ends up with 20,000 shares and um, he has 16% um, <coughs> of the shares in the company. And this, uh, so here we have a, a post money valuation of 3 million. So we have free money 2.5, um, investment amount 500,000. So we have 3 million post money valuation. Um, therefore, um, one sixth or 16% equals to 500,000 francs. Um, but when we look what happens to investor one is that he still has his 10,000 shares. So um, he has only 8% uh, shares in the company. And uh, even worse, um, those 8% uh, have a value of 250,000. So although he did invest the same amount as investor two, um, investor one ends up with uh, half uh, of the shares of investor two. And if there is no anti dilution protection, then it was just bad luck for investor one. Now we're looking at the result. What happens if we do have an anti dilution protection? Let's say um, we have 
the full ratchet anti-dilution. Um, and again, we have the, the same um, second round. So we have, again, a pre-money valuation of 2.5. Price per share is 25 francs. And the investment amount of investor 2 is 500,000. So what happens here is that investor 1, because due to this anti-dilution protection, he will receive additional shares. So he, investor 1, will be put in the situation as if investor one would have had invested for a issue price of 25 francs per share. So we're taking the 500,000 um, investment amount of investor one divided by those 25 francs. So in order to say if this investor would have invested on in the second round, so, so he would have had um, a chance to subscribe for shares for 25 francs. So investor one would receive um, 20,000 shares instead of the 10,000. So he gets additional 10,000 shares. Um, then here the question is, where does investor two, investor one get the shares from? Um, in this example, we're saying um, investor one shall receive it from founder one and two. So as we can see here, founder one and two, they had 45,000. Now they have only 40,000 because each of them transfers 5,000 shares to investor one. So these are the anti-dilution shares that investor one receives. So in this scenario, investor one uh, ends up with 20,000 and is in the same position as investor two, um, who has subscribed for the shares in this financing round two. And this um, is all to the detriment of the founder one and two. As we can see, um, the value of their share in the company decreases to 1 million and they have 33 percent instead of in this scenario where we did not have an anti-dilution and they had still 37.5 and 1 million 125,000 and here it goes down to 1 million and 33 percent so the effect of this down round is completely borne uh, by or the negative effect is completely borne by the founder one and two and investor one and investor two um, still uh, have the or uh, have a share in the company which um, complies to what they have invested the five hundred thousand. All right. So Peter, we have a question. So I'm gonna. I also have like questions from from my side, but we have a question from Francois um, Bienholtz first. And the question is: How often are there are different treatments of shareholders, for example, shareholders who were participating in the first round versus investors entering later in your experience. So basically the question is, you know, are seed investors treated differently than Series A investors? Do they get different terms? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I see that, um, well, it, it depends also a bit then on the Series A round, but and, and, and also on the investment amounts. But if we see a very uh, substantial or, or investor who um, uh, invests a, a very substantial amount in a Series A, um, I wouldn't say that this investor dictates the terms then, but, but uh, yeah, this is what we said before. If we have two, um, or if the, if the company has grown to two far reaching rights to, to, to early investors, then sometimes the uh, Series A investor wants to even renegotiate or, or just just uh, uh, have senior ranking rights. So yeah, but it, it depends a bit on on the on the uh, exact situation and uh, how much the um, yeah what was the, what was the what was the valuation, what was uh, the rights that have been granted, what was the investment amount. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, the the the. the the rights are not usually not granted for eternity. So. And it also like depends on the trajectory, right, of the startup. I mean, if the startup is doing great, right. then it's more likely that the investors will be treated equally. And, you know, if the startup is doing, you know, bad, then obviously the next investors have more leverage, right, to negotiate better terms for themselves. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. At the end, it's really a question of negotiation power. And yeah, what you just said, I mean, if the company 
more or less goes bankrupt without further investing, then uh, it's uh, a bit harder to negotiate uh, mm -hmm. on the founder side and also for, for the early investors. Um, but yeah, it can also be very different. So it's, 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 it's difficult to just um, uh, answer that in general. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we see that, that um, uh, investors want to see uh, or want to have senior banking rights. All right. So we have another question. We will try to answer that question, but it's a tax question. So what are the fiscal implications, you know, for the shares received from the anti-dilution protection? Is that, you know, the question is, is it a donation or what exactly is it? <laughs> As you said, yes, a tax question. I, I would uh, double check with my tax colleagues, but I, I wouldn't know. It's in my view, it's not a donation because it's something that you agreed on the very beginning and you anticipated that in case this scenario occurs, you will transfer shares. So I wouldn't say it's it's not it's not it's not a a, a donation and it shouldn't trigger any um, uh, taxes in this regard because it's just uh, I mean you it's like when you agree on on a different pre money valuation so at the end it's a question of how it was negotiated and this is just something that the parties um, agreed from the very beginning and if it uh, uh, if this down round occurs then uh, it happens what was agreed in the very beginning so I don't see. Uh, big, big tax issues there, but I would, of course, double check with my colleagues. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I also agree with you. It's definitely important to, you know, to have an agreement for that, you know, right from the beginning, as you said. I mean, if it's like just an oral agreement, then, you know, tax authorities, you know, yeah. could say that, you know, it's a donation. But if you have basically an agreement that lays out that you are entitled, you know, for the investment amount that you paid, to basically a repricing, then it should be basically, you know, a uh, matter of how the um, your investment agreement and the shareholder agreement then is structured and then it shouldn't be like a tax issue, but that's why it's like very important to, you know, basically have, have it and um, have that provision in the shareholders agreement right when that investor comes in and you agree on that anti-dilution provision yeah yeah plus i mean usually there's these are i mean i mean if these are unrelated unrelated parties so founders do not uh transfer the shares for fun they do it because they they agreed to do it so, so it's not it's it's yeah i don't see their risk uh, of a donation yeah it's an obligation right absolutely as well yeah <laughs> and so um just like from a from a practical perspective like you know how are you like you know advising your investors to you know insist on such an anti-dilution clause and if yes you know which one and what about if what if you know advise the startups yeah i mean i i do advise um investors to uh, have such an anti-dilution protection not full ratchet i think full ratchet goes um in most cases too far um but um, to have a, let's say, broad-based uh, average weighted clause. Um, it's just, I mean, and we all hope uh, that this, uh, it, it will never be triggered. So it's, it's just a protection in case of down round. So um, yeah, I th in my view, it's quite standard. And also from a founder's perspective, it's, it's if it is, um, yeah, if it's not full ratchet, if it's just in a, in a, and then we can also, of course, discuss where should the shares come from. It has a certain effect, whether it is, whether the, the shares shall be transferred from the founders or whether there will be new shares issued. Um, so yeah, but but I think in a um, reasonable, reasonably structured, uh, I think it makes sense to have an anti dilution protection uh, in the shareholders agreement. All right. So Peter, we have like six minutes left. Yes. Um, so let's move on. Yes. So we're already at the conclusion wrap up. Um, yeah. I mean, so what we have seen before here, I think there is a there is a more room of negotiations that um, um, I usually see. So as I said, there there's it's very obvious for everyone that uh, the pre money valuation can be negotiated, um, but there are many ways on how to structure the non participating participating liquidation preference that are even 
mixes between the two of them. So, so first, of course, we do, as we have seen, the preference amount can be defined. Um, yeah, the, the, the spectrum that is quite open. What, what I also see from time to time is a catch up. So let's say if we have a participating um, liquidation preference, then the preference amount goes to the um, uh, uh, investors, to the preferred shareholders. Um, but then that we have a catch up so that uh, a certain amount um, goes then to the uh, other shareholders. So there's not just um, the exit receipts minus the preference amount and then everything will be distributed according to shareholding, but that we have after um, distributing the preference amount, then we have uh, a certain amount which goes to the other shareholders. So this, that's the catch up. And then um, uh, we distribute uh, uh, as uh, according to the, to the shareholding. Um, so then the cap, which yeah, investors usually don't like, obviously, so that we say that there is a certain maximum cap uh, in total for investors, which I very rarely see. Um, and then as we have seen also the pre-money valuation, which can be um, referred to when discussing non-participating versus participating liquidation preferences. Um, also the connection that we've seen anti-dilution clauses versus pre-money valuation. Um, yeah, a high pre-money pre valuation or an extremely high pre-money valuation can be um, um, very much less detrimental for a, for investor if you have a a, a strong anti-dilution clause. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's just what I was trying to point out is that there are ways to 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 connect those um, those those provisions that uh, it also sometimes um, helps to um, move on in, in negotiations that we can, uh, yeah, it's not just it's, because pre-money valuation is just a number, so it's not that easy. So it's like, uh, I say five and the other, uh, the other say seven. So then uh, we found those, I don't know, it's six, but there, there are other ways than to just talk about figures. Um, and yeah, I think very important is that you do your model calculations that, that, uh, that uh, the parties do not um, face uh, surprises um, at the time um, of the of the exit. As the example that uh, I was referring to, um, looks first as a big success of the founders that they could push the um, the uh, pre-money valuation, but at the end um, they uh, end up uh, in a in a worse place as they would have if they did not switch. Um, from participating to non from non participating to participating, of course, depending then again on the exit price. But that's that's why it is it is important to do model calculations uh, to understand uh, what are the consequences of the different clauses. All right. So thanks a lot, Peter. And I you know we have now our Q and A. So you know before I basically you know ask you a couple of questions. I, you know, I give the audience, our audience, the opportunity to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you know, just wait a couple of seconds. So, so I mean, I have a question. So, <laughs> so I mean, do do you think that you know investors and startups like are basically not you know aware of that interplay between the pre-money valuation the liquidation preference and the anti-dilution or what is what's your experience there yeah i i think sometimes there is a, a bit of lack of awareness of, of those of those correlations yeah this is just yeah that's what i really see sometimes that uh that um, when I when I ask also founders, uh, I ask them, um, yeah, of course they know what the pre-money valuation is. But when I when I ask uh, what did you agree on lick pref, so sometimes I receive the term sheet. Um, I was not involved uh, at uh, at the early negotiations, and then uh, I ask them uh, what, what is the lick pref that you agreed on, and then they're saying not 100 percent sure what what uh, what we agreed there. So so it's just yeah, and and also I mean the the anti-dilution protection is quite a complex formula <laughs> uh, we could have a separate uh, webinar about that but yeah it's just i think it's um i think sometimes there is a 
uh, a bit uh, lack of awareness of that, but I mean, it's uh, and there's so many many things in those contracts, and this is just one aspect. But I think it, it's it's a quite a crucial aspect because at the end it determines the allocation of the of the exit receipts, and this is what we're all um, hoping to get a big piece uh, of the cake. All right. So basically, I mean, my takeaway of that session is that we have three major important economic terms not only the pre-valuation is important but also the liquidation preference which determines basically you know the multiple that you get in case of an exit we also have the anti-dilution rights which protects you you know against like a lower um next round valuation and entitles you to more shares um, it is absolutely like critical you know to not only focus on you know the next round but also you know on the follow-on rounds basically you know take into consideration the full equity story when you negotiate just because like usually early stage investors um will also you know face basically negotiations with later stage investors and um that's basically it absolutely agree <laughs> so thank you so much so yeah looking forward to 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 meeting you again and to our audience yeah please connect with with um, peter on linkedin or send him an email if you have any questions and um yeah so that's it thank you so much for watching thank you very much for having me thank you so we have our next webinar on October 13 and with Dr. Thomas Billiter, how to build a syndicate, how to pool investors. So I'm super excited about that webinar where we will learn how basically, you know, you can include your fellow investors in a deal, um, you know, without having, you know, multiple people on the cap table. So I'm very excited about that. And please subscribe, you know, to our um, to our newsletter on sigtick.ch slash academy. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love to learn, you know, um, your inputs. Um, please give us insights and comment on our um, education material. And please stay tuned. Bye-bye.